but we're going to start in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this to you. And I only put the first line in your, in your handout. So if you want to follow along your Bible, you want to open up to that. Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Yes. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. So the Apostle Paul tells us how we can rejoice always. He tells us that it's important for us to be rejoicing always, that through rejoicing, it's going to become evident even to other people, they're going to see our forbearance. They're going to see our endurance. They're going to see our patience. They're going to see that strength in us that causes us to rejoice no matter what kind of situation we're in. Amen. Now, people in the world will panic. They'll freak out. They will worry. It may be very dramatic, but when you are rooted and grounded in the Lord, there is a peace that surpasses all understanding, even if you are in a situation of change, even if you are in a situation where you don't know the next step, and yet God tells you to take the first step. And you may not know the second step, but he tells you to take the first step. Well, it takes faith. And one way to keep your faith high, to be able to continue to walk the faith walk with the living God, is by praising him. Because I don't think it's very easy to praise him and be depressed at the same time. It's not very easy to praise him and to be discouraged. You have to choose which one you're going to side with. You're either going to side with the lies of the enemy or you're going to side with the written word of God and maybe even the spoken word that he's given to you of a promise of something that's going to come to pass down the road. And you may not see it with your natural eyes, but in your heart, just as Abraham knew that he could count on the promises of God, we as his children, as believers, can count on the promises of God. Mm -hmm. yes. Amen? Yes. Now, where there's Job, let's talk about him for a little bit. And the Bible scholars say that all of the, the tests and trials that he went through, it most likely, uh, it was probably only about nine months. Okay, it's easy to say only nine months when it's not my test and it's not my trial. Yeah. But still, some people will think, you know, it dragged out for years. How could God allow, you know, uh, somebody like that to go through something like that? We don't have all the answers as to why Job went through what he went through, but there's some things that we can learn from him. When we read about Job, it says that when he was told that his livestock were killed and his servants were killed and his sons and his daughters were killed, that he ripped his clothes and he worshiped God. Now, what kind of a reaction is that? Would that be your first reaction? Gee, I, I don't know how we'd answer that. I've never been through that, thanks be to God. And by the grace of God, neither will you. Amen. But we can learn from his response. No matter what he was going through, no matter what happened, he knew his God. He knew his God loved him. He knew his God was faithful through every test, through every trial, through everything he had to go through. I think he also must have known that the cure for endurance was going to be staying in a place where he was praising God no matter what. You're either going to be happy or you're going to be sad. Now, there is a time for grief and there is a time for mourning. I'm not, I'm not denying that. That's very real. It's very valid. God gave us feelings. He gave us tears. There are things that we need to process. But when we look at his response, he didn't stay in a place like that. 
he worshiped God. If he could worship God when his sons and his daughters had been killed, when his livestock had been killed, when his servants had been killed, certainly we are able. Certainly we are able to do the same. How did Abraham do it when God gave him the promise of a, of a child? Well, the word of God tells us that he didn't waver in unbelief, but he grew strong because he put his faith and his confidence in the word of God. And when he put his faith and his confidence in the word of God, it gave him the strength. It gave him the energy to be able to believe, to be able to hold on to that promise until it was fulfilled. Yet his body was past the time of, of, of being able to have children, and so was his wife Sarah's. She was well past the time of childbearing. Yet God gave them a promise, and he held on to that promise. When we look at that in the Amplified, the Amplified um, uh, talking about Abraham says that he grew strong and was empowered by faith as he gave praise and glory to God. He grew strong. He may have been strong, but he was growing stronger. How? How was he growing strong? How was he empowered by faith? By giving praise and glory to God. One of the most crucial times in our life to praise and worship God is not when everything is a piece of cake. It's not when everything is a bed of roses. It's at the hardest time. It's at the hardest time. It's when you don't know your next step. It's when you've been believing for a fulfillment of a promise from the Lord for a long time, and it just doesn't seem like it's happened. And maybe it's 18 years later. Maybe it's 15 years later. Maybe it's six years later. Maybe there are some battles you've been facing that you feel like, when, God? When? And yet, if you just won't quit, if you just won't give up, and if you'll praise him, he will have an answer for you. Yes. It's about holding on by faith and praising him no matter what comes against you. Oh, holding on and praising him. It's about not being discouraged by opposition. It's about not letting people's comments weigh you down. I had somebody say to me, how can you send, who are you to send your child to such an expensive university? And I remember standing there and I thought, do I respond or do I not respond? And I chose not to. Because I knew they weren't going to be open to what I had to say. I, it's not about me. It's not about who I am. It's not about my resources. It's about hearing the voice of God, hearing his plan, hearing his voice, and then following it. And when you'll follow the plan of God, even though it seems bigger than you, bigger than you, and I'm going to share this. This was bigger than me. $180,000 somebody committed to paying. That's bigger than me. It's bigger than my resources. It's bigger than my ability. It wasn't a grant. It wasn't a scholarship. It was somebody. How about that? Awesome, and not my relative, awesome. and not Brad's relative. How about that? Awesome. So people will come against you, and it may be your own relatives, to try to push you down, to push your faith down. Who are you? Who do you think you are? What do you think you're doing? What do you think you're going after? And just think in yourself, it's my God is a mighty God. Right. My God is mighty. Yes, yes. My God is mighty. Yes, yes. He is mighty, and I know him. And I know how to hear his voice. I know when he speaks. I know when he tells me to turn left or turn right or go straight or wait, which is the most difficult, isn't it? That wait, that wait, and then you pray again and you get wait again. Good night, how long are we going to wait? And sometimes he will allow you to wait until the midnight hour and the clock is ticking. Uh, Lord. <laughs> As though we need to tell him anything. As though we need to tell him deadlines. God, I've got a deadline here. I've got a deadline. He knows your deadlines. He knows them already. But we still will tell him anyway, don't we? We still have to remind him. Now, God, I'm just reminding you about the deadline. But he'll come through for you. He will come through for you because he's faithful. 
So if we can praise him in the good times, then we've got to be willing to give him what we can call a sacrifice of praise in the hard times, in the times where sometimes things can seem confusing or cluttered or not clear, and yet we're called to praise him at those times. We're called to praise him when we don't see the full answer. He says, step, you make the first payment. And you're like, you, you want to know what my first payment was for his college? I wrote, I am going to, I wrote the check, $8,100. It was due like August 1. And I thought, oh, and I'm like, this is a lot of money. And then, and then comes September 1. Well, we've got to write another check. Here comes another 8,100 and something. I'm like, that was not very much time. <laughs> not very much time passed between the first check and the second check. Hallelujah. We didn't have all the answers, and yet God came through and provided it all. Sometimes, listen, if you want to be a people of faith and you want to walk by faith, and you are and you do, otherwise you wouldn't be here and you wouldn't be listening to this. You are listening to this because you are a people of faith. You are faith people. There are times where God will call us to do something that nobody else will understand. Nobody else may support you in it. And if you are not willing to take step one, step two and three may never materialize if you're not obedient. That's a faith walk. The faith walk is you do what he told you to do and you take that step, even if you don't know the next one. That's faith. That's the same way you prophesy. You know, you can all prophesy. Every one of you can prophesy. You, doesn't, you don't have to be a prophet, but you can prophesy. The Bible talks about let us all prophesy one by one, which means we all have the ability. Well, how do you get a word from the Lord? How do you prophesy? It's a step of faith. In the same way you get a step to do something, to take an action, you've got to take the first step. Sometimes before you see the second step, it's the same thing with giving a word from the Lord. He may just give you one word. You just have unction for one word, like freedom. You're like, God, you want me to go up and say one word? You want me to go up and say the word freedom? And, and just some unction. Yeah, say the word freedom. And you'll go up, and if you'll be faithful, and you'll say that one word freedom, suddenly here comes a flow of, a, of another sentence and another sentence and another sentence. But if you don't ever take the first step to step out in faith like that, then the rest may not come. Sometimes we can even say it will not come because you're going you're gonna to put a cork on the Spirit of God. Well, don't put a cork on the Spirit of God and don't put a cork on your own life. Mm -hmm. You are people of faith. When God calls you to step out, step out. When God calls you to do something, you do something. And that's where we're going to find fulfillment. That's where we're going to find the exciting Christian life. I really have never been bored since I got born again. There's really no time <laughs> to get bored. He has me living such an adventurous life by following him by faith that it's so exciting and so wonderful, I just can't imagine doing anything else. Nothing else would be as much fun. Nothing else would be as exciting. You could fly a plane, you could, do, you could go bungee cord jumping, you can do lots of things in life, but I'm telling you, the greatest thrill is following the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He designed you before you were born. He thought about you. He knew you. The Word of God says he's got every hair on your head numbered. That's pretty good. I would say that's knowing you very, very well. Every hair on your head numbered. Does he know you? Oh, boy, does he ever know you. He most certainly does. And before he even created you as part of that whole process in creating you, he created a plan for your life. There is something that you're called to do while you're on this earth. He does have a plan for you. He's got a purpose. He's got a place for you to be, a place for you to live, a place for you to uh, share the gospel. He's got a plan. Your life has a purpose. There's a glorious plan for you, but it's going to take faith to walk it out. 
Again, you may not see step two or three. You're going to need to be obedient to step one before you're going to see the others. Sometimes, and I, and I would say this often, God will call you to do something that is beyond your resources. And it may even seem to be beyond your strength, beyond your ability. I think sometimes God must like to do this to us because it keeps us completely dependent on him. Amen. There are times where he asked me to do something and, and in this last year I thought, do I have the energy? Dear God, you're going to have to help me. Do I have the energy to do what you're asking me to do? And when I get to those kind of points, what I do is I go into what I'm going to call neutral so that I don't resist the spirit of God or the leading of God and say no because it's too hard. No, I don't have the energy or the time or the resources or the money or whatever it may be. Don't go, don't go negative on God. At least go neutral. So what I'll do is I'll go neutral and I'll say, okay, I'm not going to say no to what I'm sensing, but I'm going to need help God saying yes. And then I will claim that I am subtle clay in his hands. Father, you can mold me, you can make me, you can redo me, you can bend me, you can do whatever you need to do. Now I've worked with clay. And if the clay is, I love art, if the clay is too hard, it cracks and breaks and you can't shape it, you can't mold it. It resists you and it's firm and you can't make anything good out of it. If the clay is too wet, too pliable, it's, it, it ends up just falling down and sagging and gushing and then you can't create anything that way either. Clay really has to be at a very, very specific consistency with moisture so that you can form something that's going to be lasting. And then clay has to go through a firing process so that whatever beautiful, gorgeous thing God creates will be able to last and endure. And so sometimes we as subtle clay feel like we're in the furnace because he's shaping us. The Bible talks about him pruning us. Sometimes he'll prune us. He'll prune us. And sometimes it feels hot and uncomfortable. So we bear more fruit. So we bear more fruit. So we have more endurance, more patience. So he matures us in love and in unity. It's not always a piece of cake. But if we will allow him to do that with us, he can make something beautiful with every one of us. And we already are beautiful right as we are right now. He's already accepted us. He loves us. He's forgiven us. He blesses us. He ministers to us. We're beautiful right now as we are. But then we can get to a point in life where it's not just about us receiving. It's not just even about us being healed about us getting our needs met. That's good if you're a young Christian, but then he wants to get us to the point where we're mature enough that we will be useful to him to help others get into the kingdom, to help others get healed, to help others get discipled. And so what he'll do sometimes is he'll, he'll have us in what seems to be like a very comfortable nest. Well, what birds can do is birds sometimes when their babies are in a comfortable nest, they'll feed them and it's a piece of cake and it's wonderful and you don't have to go search for your own food and you don't have to do anything. It's already pretty much even digested for them and they just take it again. Easy. Just open your mouth and swallow. But then when the mama bird gets to the point that, hey, uh, you're a grown up now. It's time for you to mature. It's time for you to fly on your own. Well, some, some of the birds will pull the feathers out of the nest, so the sticks will kind of get, it'll get a little pokey. Get a little pokey. It starts to get a little uncomfortable. And then maybe mama doesn't bring so much food home for them anymore. Why? Mom's trying to get them to grow up. <laughs> there are things you're called to do, and we're not going to be able to sit where we're just really comfortable if we're going to do what we've been called to do. <laughs> 
Sometimes there are mantles and anointings on somebody, and if they're not doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing, they're not going to be able to fulfill the call of God on their life. So they've got to identify, what's that mantle? What's that call? What's that anointing I feel come upon me, Lord? What is that? I know this is you. I know you want to do something with me. Make sure I'm in the right place at the right time. So I'm doing what you want. When we get to heaven and we stand before him, we will give an account for our life, how we've used it, what we've done with it. And what we want to be able to do, we want to be able to stand there and say, I did highest and best. We want him to say, you did highest and best. You performed my perfect will when you were on the earth. That's why you were, you were like a round peg in a round hole. That's why it was a fit for you. It was perfect for you because that's what I called you to do. That's why there seemed to be such a grace on it and so easy because you did what I called you to do. You were in the right place at the right time. There are things that we shouldn't force when they don't work. There are things that we shouldn't force when it's not a fit. And we've got to identify what is God calling us to do? Because we will not be rewarded for our own ideas. We will not necessarily be rewarded for our good works. We will be rewarded for obeying God, for doing what he created us to do, for the gifts and the, and the callings that he put inside each one of us. And for each one of us, it's different. It's different. So when he starts asking you to do something, we don't want to stiffen because it seems too big for us. All we have to do is look at everybody in the Bible. Pretty much all of them seem to be called to do things that were beyond them, harder than what they could do. You can look at Moses. You can pretty much look at every one of the disciples. And they had to overcome something. Peter had to overcome denying Jesus. Moses didn't want to go do it by himself. Moses had already killed somebody, murdered somebody, and yet God wasn't going to allow him to disqualify himself from ministering. God had a call on him, and God still wanted it to be fulfilled even though he had missed something. Even though he had missed it in an area, God wasn't letting go of the call of God on his life. Why? Because the call of God on your life is not just for you. It's wonderful that someday we hopefully will all stand before him in heaven and he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. Yeah, and we want that reward, don't we? We want him to be, pleasing with, be, to be pleased with us. We want that approval from our Father. But it's more important what we do than just that approval for him just to be pleasing with us. You are called to do something because there are other people's lives that are at stake as to whether or not you do it. They, so I keep wanting to speak in tongues. I'm trying not to. I don't, I don't, it's just like, that's the third time. Um, so if I need to go with that, then I will go with that. But um, you know what, we, we, I'm just going to go with that because there might be something that God just wants to get out. And so, Father God, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to say, your destiny is at stake. But not just your destiny, the destiny of the people that you're supposed to minister to. You may produce a music CD that will minister healing in life, and it will bless people, and somebody just listening to it will get healed. Well, if you don't produce that, then that's not going to happen. If you don't produce that, that's not going to happen. Well, God can use someone else. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes he can. Sometimes you're the last hope. That's something that's really important to take note of. When God tells you to preach the gospel to somebody, or maybe he'll say it a softer way, to share the gospel, then you need to share the gospel. I know a minister, God put it on his heart to share the gospel with somebody. And he didn't do it, and the, and the person passed away. And the Lord showed him that that person went to hell. Now, he had to deal with that, and he had to repent from that. And God forgave him, and he, he went on, and I'm sure he was probably much more diligent to be sharing the gospel after that point. You don't know when it's somebody's last chance to hear the gospel message. You don't know. It's, oh, well, God, I'll do it later. Sometimes there isn't a later for some people. We don't know what's going to happen in the Bay Area. 
We don't know what's going to happen with the economy. And if God puts it on your heart to share something, you need to share it. If God puts it on your heart to do something, you need to do it. Again, because it's not just about you. God's perspective is the kingdom perspective. Sometimes our perspective is ours. It's my life. It's what God's calling me to do. But usually what God's calling you to do is going to be end up being for the benefit for others. There are people that need to hear the gospel. God will put it on your heart. It's going to happen to you this week, I can tell you right now. He's going to put it on your heart to call somebody. And it, sometimes, you've had this happen before, it's a little nudging. It's a little kind of, gee, I'm thinking about so-and-so. I haven't thought about so-and-so in a while. I wonder why I'm thinking about so-and-so. Hmm, I wonder how they're doing. And you let it go. And then maybe a day goes by and comes up again. Hmm, I'm thinking about that person. And I wonder how they're doing. I wonder what's going on with them. And you let it go again. That's the leading from the Holy Spirit. We need to learn to follow these little leadings so that when we're following the little leadings, we'll know the big leadings. It's the same God leading us. Well, I thought that was just me, somebody will say. It is just you. You've got a born-again spirit recreated by the living God, and he ministers to you in your spirit. And he's the one that gives you these thoughts and these ideas. You know it's not the devil, right? Oh, it's not going to be the devil distracting you. There are enough other things to be distracted by. This is because God wants you to minister life to somebody somehow. So don't drop these little tiny things. Somebody recently asked me, how, how do you be led by God? How, how do you know God's voice? How do, you, how do you know it so clearly? You know it by obeying. You know it by staying sensitive. You know it by... Um, experience you know it by walking with him and and really seeking after him what are you saying to me what do you want me to do father is this your will and then when you sense that something's his will you take it seriously and you take it to him in prayer god i just want to confirm that this is you i want confirmation that this is what you're telling me to do is this what you're telling me to do so that it, it's got to bear witness with your spirit. I'm not talking about going by an outside voice out here. I'm talking about a, a voice in your spirit or a knowing, bearing witness in your spirit. And then you pray that out. That's got to be confirmed. You've got to know that you know that you know that it's God. Now, here's something. Sometimes people think something's God and they run, run after it really fast. And they run after it so fast that they didn't take the time to pray it out to see if it was really God. So then the first time a hardship comes, the thought comes to them, oh, maybe this wasn't God. Maybe I wasn't supposed to do this. Maybe this isn't what I'm supposed to be doing. And so hardship or hardship, hardship, then it all is then it, you, you question yourself and what you're doing, and it's really easy to quit. So before you start a big project, you've got to pray it through enough to know whether or not it's God, right? Yeah. And don't step out until you know it's God. Now, I'm talking to you about, about by faith taking the first step. Yes, you must take the first step so that the second and the third will come, but don't take the first step until you're positive it's God. Positive is, an, is maybe a too firm of a word. Until the best of your ability in your spirit, you really believe it's God. The bigger the project, the more you need to pray, and the more you need to be sure that you've heard from him. And then you move forward. Because then when the hardship comes, it's like one of those, you know, I ha we had this clown when I was a little kid. I, I don't think they make them anymore. But anyway, it's, it was like a clown, and then it was, it was filled up with air, and it was just kind of looked like a, a, a punching bag, kind of. And then in the bottom, it had sand. And you could, Susie's nodding her head, maybe you, got, you had one too. Anyway, my brother, well, I think my parents probably thought it was better for us to beat up on that than each other. So anyway, so <clears throat> you could slug this clown, and the clown would go, Poof, and it hit the ground, and it'd pop right back up. And then you could hit it again, and it'd Poof, go down and pop right back up. We need to be like that. Come on. You can take a knock, and it's like, well, all right. You know, I'm turning that one over to the Lord, but I'm going to come back up smiling because if this is what he's called me to do, I'm going to keep doing it. And you can't keep me down. Yeah. <laughs> you can't keep me down. You know those little candles, that, that, that those trick candles they give for birthdays now? 
where you blow it out and it doesn't really go out and it lights back up. We need to be like that as born again believers. Yeah. Yeah. When God gives us a project or an assignment, uh, something, that destiny that you know you have, that dream that's deep in your heart. I really want to do this. When am I going to have time? When am I going to be able to? We need to be like that candle that it, yeah, sure, it looks, for, it looks like you just blew it out and then comes right back, lights right back up, won't go out, yeah. won't go out. Yeah. You can't put out my light. Come on. You can't put out my fire. You can't put out my zeal. You can't discourage me. You can't tell me I can't. Do you understand? You can't tell me I can't. You can't tell me where my son can't go to school because I know God. You can't tell me I can't. If God says I can, I can. Just, I want you to think of that, that this clown punching bag. I want you to think of that, that candle that won't go out. You can't tell me what I can't do. Only God can do that. Only the living God can tell me what I can't do or what I shouldn't do. But man is not going to tell me what I can't do. Come on. Right? Right? I mean it. Can you, can you tell I mean it? I mean it. I was an au pair in France. I'm going to tell you the story. And I was miserable. I really didn't like it. I, was, I had my 16th year old birthday there. And we thought it would be good, au pair meaning you take care of their kids all summer. Okay, I lived in a great house. I had a swimming pool. I could have stayed at home and taught private swimming lessons and art lessons, which is what I had been doing, and it was just cush. I made like four times, five times the amount of money, all my friends. I worked one hour, and they worked all day. I had a good life. I still have a good life. But anyway, so I'm in, I've got this cush situation. We think, okay, it might be good. This is before I was walking with God. might be good to go have this experience in France because I'd taken three years of French. Thought it would be good to get my fourth year of French in to make school easier. And so my parents set me up so that I could go be an au pair in France. And the, a couple other girls that got set up to do this got really good families. <clears throat> And I remember laying in bed crying. You know how long ago that was? I was so lonely. I wanted to quit so bad. And they told me they'd had other au pairs quit. Well, I know why, <laughs> you know. They didn't discipline their children. Their children had a maid the rest of the year. I was just coming in for the summer to fill in. They had a five-year-old that was still in, no, no, he wasn't five, the other one was five. They had a two-and-a-half-year-old that was still in diapers. That I mean blew him out. I, I'm sorry, this is gross, but I'm going to tell you this. He blew him out one time so bad that his crib was the whole room. I, don't, I didn't know how stuff could get where it got. <laughs> and I remember it walls, walls, floor, and the diaper was still on. I'm like, what did you do? <laughs> Anyway, so, and I, I'm having these thoughts of, I could be at my parents' swimming pool. I could be giving private swimming lessons, private art lessons, and I'm looking at this room thinking, I have to clean this up. Oh, I have to clean this up. And they treated me like a, a servant, which I guess technically I was, but I really didn't like being treated like that. <laughs> and, so, and so, and that's not how I was brought up. And so, so. I wanted to go home. I will tell you, I wanted to go home. 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 And I'd lay in bed at night and cry. And I was in a castle. It was this, it was a castle. But anyway, but they didn't have heat. It was this old French castle with no heat. And so I was freezing. You know how I don't like to be cold. And so I'm freezing. I'm cleaning up poop that goes in places that never should have gone. He's too old for diapers like this anyway. Good night. He should have been potty trained a long time ago. And then, I, then the five-year-old comes into my room one time, and she gets a pen. I don't know how she got into my room. She gets into my room, and she takes her pen, and she draws all over my clothes. Well, you know, you, you, I traveled with a suitcase, so how many do you have? Not that many. And now I've got ink all over my clothes. Do you know they didn't even give her a spanking for that? They didn't even give her a spanking for that. So the summary of this 
is that they told me about how they had had other au pairs come and quit. And unfortunately, we didn't really even work out the details of my pay until I was over there. She said, we'll pay you the price of your airfare, which wasn't very much. This was a long time ago. And I remember thinking, I'm working for free. <laughs> I'm cleaning up poop for free. <laughs> so I just, and so, and, I, and, and they'd had other au pairs quit. And I considered it. And I thought, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to quit. Everything in me wanted to quit. I wanted to quit so badly, you have no idea. <laughs> but I, I, okay, I'm gonna, I don't know why I'm telling you this. OK, yes, because you need this kind of determination to do what God wants you to do. OK, there were no screens on the windows. And it was freezing cold. And it wasn't insulated. And so there was one room where I would build a fire. And I would make it the room. And I'd try to get the kids to want to stay in there and play in there. And I'd try to entertain them in that room so that I could be somewhat warm. And, and so because it wasn't insulated well, and there were kind of, must have been, I don't know. Anyway, flies got in the room. And so there were always flies. I'm in a castle, but it's nasty because it hasn't been maintained, right? And it hasn't been updated or anything. And, and there are flies buzzing around this room. OK, I want you to know I caught them. I killed them, and I counted them, and there were 94. <laughs> That's how many flies were buzzing around in this room. Why? Did they want the heat? I don't know. But that was, I was like, this was my room. OK, it was not pleasant. Then, to top it off, grandma, their grandma comes to visit. And I'm the oldest girl now in the house, 15 turning 16. So it's my responsibility to serve tea around 3 o'clock to the other ladies. So when I, if they have anybody over, I have to serve tea to everybody. OK, so I go to serve tea. And I do it. <clears throat> and grandma says to me, OK, my French wasn't that great, but I'd had three years of it. And I went so that I could learn to become more fluent so my fourth year would be easier. And grandma says to me, I said something in French, probably slaughtered the language, but anyway, she says in English, if you can't speak French perfectly, don't speak it at all. Now, if they had said that to me now, I would have handled it different than I did then. I still, would have, I still probably would have remained silent but I wouldn't have allowed it to stop me. That totally bottled me up. And I, I, that was the last French word I spoke for a long time. <clears throat> but I did not quit. I did not quit them. I did not leave them. I did not quit. Now, I'm not saying there's any reward in heaven for that. Because it wasn't like God led me to go. I wasn't walking with God at the time, OK? But if we can have that kind of determination, that kind of um, um, perseverance in the natural, then what kind of perseverance and determination do we need to have for the kingdom of God? What kind of perseverance and determination do you need to have for the call of God that's on your life? The enemy is still on this earth, and he does want to discourage you try to disqualify you or tell you that you're disqualified even though God says you are qualified through Jesus Christ. But he's going to be trying to feed you lies and attack you. And one of the greatest attacks, one of his greatest strategies, if he can't get you into sin, is to cause you to be distracted with busyness and with good instead of perfect. Don't settle for good. Go for perfect. Go for highest and best. Because it's, it's your life. And whatever you're called to do, there are going to be people that are dependent on you to do it. And some of them, it may be for their salvation. When I first kind of had an, one of my first encounters with God, I'm just going to tell you this. Um, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't like this earth that much, but I'd, I'd grown up well. I had a great life. Everything was wonderful. But I figured heaven was probably better. So I, I was begging God to take me to heaven, which, you know, 
I, I was, just to tell you, I was begging him. And I bugged him so much that he finally allowed me to have an encounter with him. And in this encounter, I don't know if I did go or if it was a dream. It was at night. Um, and when I went, I appeared before him, and Jesus was there, and there were some of the other apostles there. And I remember he spoke to me, and I remember because this experience lasted for three days after this. Um, I had this time with him, and he spoke with me, and he allowed me only to remember some of it, and some of it, it was like he wiped it out of my mind. And I don't know why he did that, <clears throat> but the part that I remember, that he allowed me to remember, is... Um, I told him I wanted to stay. And he said, if you stay, there will be people that will be in hell for all of eternity. And you'll live here knowing that. And I thought, oh, well, that I didn't like. I felt such peace and such love surrounding me that I didn't want to leave. It wasn't an experience like other people have talked about, like Robert's Lurden, where they walk through the garden and they walk on grass and it pops back. I didn't see any of that. This was just Jesus. And I saw a couple other um, men, some of the apostles. And, um, and so I realized I wouldn't want to live there knowing that there was something I was supposed to do that I hadn't done that there was something about other people's lives that, because I hadn't done what I was supposed to do. And you know, we can think to ourselves, well, can't God use somebody else? There are times that he can, but how about in this one situation I shared with you about that minister that was supposed to share the gospel with somebody and he didn't, and that person ended up dying right away. That was that person's last chance. There wasn't somebody else God could use, apparently, in that situation, in that time frame. There are people you come into contact with that maybe nobody else will share the gospel with. Maybe you are the one. Maybe you need to do it. So when you have that prompting, that, that unction out of your heart, you need to do it. You need to do it because you don't know what's going to happen to them tomorrow, next week. Maybe they get transferred, they get another job, and you don't see them again. When God puts it on your heart to share, that, that kind of that, that unction, that just, gee, I wonder if I should. Well, I wonder if I should usually is, and that's usually the prompting from the Lord, right? Just like, gee, I wonder why I keep thinking about so-and-so and calling so-and-so. Well, probably because that's the prompting of the Lord. That's, you're being led by the Spirit of God. We just need to uh, identify and understand that he's leading us. Anyway, so I said, okay, I'd come back. And... Um, and it might have all been a dream. This could have been totally a dream. But for three days, I never had a negative thought. For three days, it was like I was surrounded in this love bubble, this incredible love. It was so awesome. It was so great. So I'm sharing this with you because I've wondered, well, why didn't God say, you don't go back. There's a church I want you to start and, you know, whatever. I don't know. He didn't say that. Or there's a Bible school I want you to do. I want you to teach people. I don't know. He never said any of those things. And yet to me, he has told me that he wants me to teach. You know, he told me to start the Bible school. Okay, so I've gotten these things from him that I'm still supposed to do. But the thing that seemed to be the most important to him, or at least in that interaction I had with him, was people's salvation. People can get to heaven and learn more about God in heaven. They can learn more about the Bible in heaven. And my understanding is that, that we do learn and we do study in heaven. If people don't learn and study here on the earth, that we still advance, we still make progress, and we still learn. So there's got to be something about salvation. So if somebody in here is called to get people saved, you need to get on that. You need to get on that. You need to do what God's told you to do. Maybe these salvations for me, well, I came, okay, I, my roommate got born again right after that. Then a whole bunch of my friends got born again. And then my family all got born again. So a lot of people got, got born again. 
maybe it was coming back to do this church so that, that Brad could hook up with the man that was doing the crusades in Africa and we could get 10,000 salvations in Africa. Well, praise the Lord. Well, maybe if we'd never done this, maybe that wouldn't have happened. Maybe we wouldn't have met him. We wouldn't have gone to Brazil. We wouldn't have met him. We wouldn't have made that divine connection and we wouldn't have sowed that seed. And in, I've been to Africa. It's a lot easier to send money. <laughs> Okay, if you have a, a, a safe source, okay, unless you know that you know that you know you're called to go there, it's a lot easier to send money. There's something you're supposed to do on this earth, and the first thing is praise God. In the good times and in the bad, whether you're happy or you're sad, first thing you're called to do is praise God. If you have nothing else to thank him for, then you can at least be thankful for your salvation. And you can start there. What I want you to do today is I want you to think of five things God's done for you. Just the first five things that, that pop in your mind. If you can, write them down. I want you to think about them because we're going to close and we're going to um, sing a couple songs. And I want these songs to stick in your spirit all week. I want them to be so easy that as you go throughout your week that these will come up. Because there may, you may be in a trying time, a difficult time. You may be in a great time where you're rejoicing and you're celebrating. No matter what kind of a situation you're in, we need to be praising God. Because this keeps our faith strong. It keeps us happy. It keeps us in joy instead of sorrow or depression or discouragement. Faith is important. Joy is important. And you can tell your faith level by your joy level. So if we will stay praising, we will keep our joy level up. And when our joy level is up, our faith level is up. They're connected. They affect each other. So we want to stay in joy. We want to stay praising God so that we stay in faith so that then we can also continue to do all the things that he's called us to do. Right? Amen.